Hey, y'all. My name is Susan Sparks, and I'm the senior pastor here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church in New York City. We are a diverse community brought together by faith. We hope that you enjoy our service today. Good morning, everybody. This is your tenor, Richard Binder, coming to you from a very cloudy day in Astoria, Queens. That just means it's a little quieter around here than it usually is, which is perfect for our next hymn. Hymn number 575, Come and Find the Quiet Center. Please sing with me. Come and find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame where we are free. Clear the chaos and the clutter, clear our eyes that we can see all the things that really matter, be at peace and simply be. Silence is a friend who claims us, cools the heat and slows the pace. God it is who speaks and names us, knows our being touches base, making space within our thinking, lifting shades to show the sun, raising courage when we're shrinking, finding scope for faith begun. In the spirit let us travel, open to each other's pain. Let our loves and fears unravel, celebrate the space we gain. There's a place for deepest dreaming, there's a time for heart to care. In the spirit's lively scheming, there is always room to spare. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sunday. It's Jenny Lindsay, your resident MABC soprano in Upper, Upper, Upper Manhattan. Please join me in singing hymn number 53, Morning Has Broken. That's number 53. Morning has broken. The title of my sermon today is A Partnership Made in Heaven. So this week I, um, I don't know, I've just been really missing our cabin in Wisconsin. I mean, what am I saying? I miss it all the time. But for some reason it was just a little more poignant this week for some reason. And I, so I started looking at photos on my phone, which is what I do when I want to remember that beautiful place. And I always tend to migrate to three of my favorite ones. It's, it's three taken back to back to back in one moment after I caught what I consider to be probably my favorite fish of all time. So 
Maybe Travis, could you show those photographs right now? Those three photographs? Yep, yep, yep. It's not what you would expect. This is probably a five minute old perch. <laughs> I mean, it's not even something that like Gordons of Gloucester would take on. It's like not even a fish stick, but it was so adorable. I just loved it. I have to say though, I was a little bit surprised when I caught it. You know, as a seasoned fisherwoman, I have learned that if you wanna catch really big fish, then usually you need to use really big bait. So early in the morning that particular day, I was out there with a big old hook with some nasty, wiggly, gross night crawlers, which are these huge worms, but they're yummy fish breakfast. So I threw those big nasty worms out there on that giant hook. And the second I tossed it out there, the bobber went down, I set the hook, and it was fighting pretty well. I was like, I got a big fish, this is awesome. Maybe it's a bass, maybe it's a big panfish. And I pull it out and it's that guy, the tiny little guy. I mean, the worm was bigger than the fish. You know, I don't know, I guess that little fish, I could just see him coming up to the worm going, I'm gonna eat you for breakfast. I don't know, I have a guess I have a soft spot in my heart for small things that do big things. You know, maybe it's that little fish that saw a hook that was bigger than its head and said, I'm gonna eat that. Or maybe it's, maybe it's like a corgi. I have a thing for corgis, those little dogs. Maybe some of you do too. They're the cutest little dogs, but they're, they don't know they're little dogs. They are little dogs that think they are big dogs. Little things that do big things. Uh, I love the book, The Little Engine That Could, growing up. Maybe some of you remember that book about the little train going up the really steep mountain. It was going, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. I guess in human terms, we would call that, you know, it's all about underdogs, you know, little things that are doing big things. Whether it's a tiny fish or a corgi or a little train going up a mountain or any underdog in life, all of them offer us the same lesson. And it's this, when you bite off something bigger than yourself, you will grow into a stronger version of yourself. Now, of course, Another great example of this lesson is our scripture today, which is the wonderful story of David and Goliath. I just don't think you can ever preach this sermon enough. And I don't even remember the last time I preached it. It's been so, it's been a, quite some time. Uh, but we remember the story. Let me uh, pull out my Bible. It's, if you want to read along with it, it's coming out of 1 Samuel 17, 4. Um, let's start in the beginning. I just want to share a few uh, descriptive words with you from the scripture. Um, and there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Goth, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, can we just pause for a minute? Six cubits and a span translates roughly to about nine and a half feet. <laughs> I mean, that's like... That's like one and a half times the height of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Now, scripture goes on to say, well, you know what, I'm just gonna paraphrase it. Scripture goes on to say that Goliath had a helmet of bronze on his head and he was armed with a coat weighing 5,000 shackles of bronze and the spearhead weighed 600 shackles of iron. I, I found a scholar that who had estimated that in ancient terms, that was over 500 pounds of armor. So clearly we're looking at a big guy. This is someone who was like a kind of an extra tall Kareem Abdul-Jabbar Abdul who has the girth of several Green Bay Packer linemen. Go Pack Go. It's a big dude, all right. So this Goliath calls the Israelites out and he tells King Saul to offer a man to fight him. And if that man would beat him, then they would all go home. But those soldiers took one look at Goliath and no one stepped up. All of King Saul's armies were afraid Goliath was too big. 
They weren't going to take him on. No one, that is, until little David, the shepherd, the youngest son of Jesse, appears. Now, this moment in the story kind of reminds me of words that I heard this week on a television broadcast. And to be honest, I can't remember which one it was, but I remember the quote, and this is it. We're all scared. It's what we do next that counts. I don't know, I kind of love that idea. We, and we all are scared right now, I think, in history and our lives and our country, but we are all scared. It's what we do next that counts. Well, like that tiny perch looking at that giant worm, David looks at Goliath and says, I'm going to eat you for breakfast. All right, that's not exactly what he said. But all right, what David actually said was, I have killed lions and bears protecting my flock. The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So what David did next was to step up. So King Saul gives David his armor and his sword, but David is so small that he can't carry the weight of it. So he puts all the armor down. The only thing he takes into battle is a sling and five smooth stones. And David looks right at Goliath and says, you come to me with sword and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And with one tiny stone, David takes Goliath down. And what happens in the end? After that, in the years to come, David goes on to become king, reigning for 40 years in one of the highest and most prosperous periods in Israel's history, called by many the Golden Age of Israel. When you bite off something bigger than yourself, you grow into a stronger version of yourself. It's a lesson and story that I think we can all relate to. We all face our Goliaths, the things in our lives that bear down on us like a combination of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and several Green Bay Packer linemen. Maybe it's worries over money or family. Maybe it's health concerns or depression or anxiety. Maybe your Goliath is your own self-doubt. Or maybe it's the searing judgment of racism or even the hatred of this world. I love the words of our new Vice President Kamala Harris in talking about the Goliaths she had to face. She said this, I have in my career been told many times, it's not your time, it's not your turn. And let me tell you this, I eat no for breakfast. Isn't that great? I love that. I've been told many times that it's not my turn, it's not my time. Well, I eat no for breakfast. Well, amen, Kamala. We all have our Goliaths. And the question is, will we turn and run? Or will we eat no for breakfast and stand and fight? Well, I think we can all agree the answer is, or should be, that we will fight. And David offers us the blueprint of how to do it. It's all about for forming a partnership. Now, those of you in the business world know that partnerships can be a powerful thing. Think about the great partnerships of history. The Wright brothers who discovered the secrets of flight. James Watson and Francis Crick who discovered the double helix of DNA. Or how about Ben and Jerry? who discovered the greatest of all inventions, Cherry Garcia. Amen, right? Whew. The list goes on and on. What makes a partnership great is that each person brings their own unique strengths, which makes the two of them together unstoppable. And that's what David did. He formed a partnership with God, a partnership made in heaven, <laughs> literally, for they each had something the other needed. David needed God's strength, and God needed a warrior on the ground 
to secure the promised land. And the two of them together were unstoppable. When we partner with God, it's the exact same thing. We have something, we each have something that the other needs. We need strength. And God needs warriors on the ground to heal, restore, and rebuild the kingdom. It's that simple. In addition to the story of David and Goliath, I also love this scripture, 2 Corinthians 2, 9. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Hearing that scripture reminds me of a story I was reading about Henry Ford unveiling the first prototype of the automobile. And he did it in order to show the world in real, visible, manifest terms what was possible. When we accept God's power, we become God's prototype, a manifestation of God's greatness, an example to all the world of what is possible. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. We become God's warrior on the ground to heal, restore, and rebuild the kingdom. Now, some of you may be saying, well, I don't really get that, because God is all-powerful, so why does God need us? Because sometimes the unbridled power of God is simply too vast, too boundless, too much for mere human beings to experience. Sometimes for people to truly see and feel the power of God, they need it filtered through another human being. I mean, think about it like this. Think back on all the times in your life where your faith was shaken. Times where, you know, you you, maybe you prayed and prayed and maybe you read scripture, maybe you reached out to God, but you didn't feel God's presence back. You you just didn't feel much of anything. Then, perhaps out of nowhere, a person shows up in your life with an uplifting word, an unexpected act of kindness. And in that moment, you felt the warmth of God's power just rain down. I mean, we've all had those moments where, you know, maybe... Maybe the the prayer and the scripture in our quiet moments, we're not connecting with God, but all of a sudden a person comes into our life and the love and power of God is just front and center. You know, sometimes we need God's power filtered through others. That's where God speaks loudest sometimes. We need strength. We need to be able to eat no for breakfast. And God needs warriors on the ground to heal and restore and rebuild the kingdom. It's a partnership made in heaven. I mean, literally. This week, if you find yourself in that place of weakness, if you find yourself really struggling, in a place where you really need God's power to rain down in your life, then I suggest that you experience the power of God filtered through our National Youth Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman. And these few select words from her poem, The Hill We Climb, that she read at the presidential inauguration. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy in change, our children's birthright. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold-limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the wind-swept north, east, where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake-rinsed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked south. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our country and every corner called our country. Our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge battered 
and beautiful. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. And the people said, Amen. This song by Larry Shackley is based on Psalm 23 and is called, My Shepherd Will Supply My Need. My shepherd will supply my need, Jehovah is his name, in pastures green he Beside the living stream, he brings my wandering spirit back when 
when I forsake his ways and leads me for his mercy's sake in paths of truth and grace. And though I walk through shades of death, your presence is my stay. One word of your supporting breath drives all my Your hand in sight of all my foes does still my table spread. My cup with blessings overflows, your oil anoints my head, the sure provisions of my God attend me all my days. Oh, find a settled rest while others go and come no more a stranger or a guest but like a child at home Thanks for joining us. Madison Avenue Baptist Church is located at 31st and Madison Avenue in New York City. Our website is www.mabcnyc.org.